Hi, welcome to Live on KEXP at Home. I'm Cheryl Waters, and I'm here with Japanese breakfast today. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Cheryl. It's so wonderful to see you. It's so wonderful to see you as well. We were just talking about how I'm glad that all of my KXB sessions have been with you. It feels like uh, we're old pals now. I know. That's one of the benefits. I have gotten <laughs> to watch your career progress and gotten to know you over the years, and it's so fun when we can catch up. You know, we were originally going to talk in mid-May a month ago, and you were in upstate New York, and I wasn't too sure how good your internet connection would be up there based on some past experiences we've had learning as we go, doing these sessions during the pandemic, so I opted to postpone so we wouldn't have one of those awkward online conversations <laughs> where someone kept dropping out or was on delay. But I have to say, I'm kind of glad that we're talking now because your fabulous new record, Jubilee, has come out in the meantime on June 4th, and it has been so fun to follow all the fanfare around it. And I am just so excited for you. It's just such a well-deserved celebratory time. I mean, people are capital L loving this new <laughs> record. You've done a bunch of cool appearances and interviews. You had your giant face up in Times Square. It looks like you've been having a blast. Tell me what it's been like since the record came out. It's been so surreal. Um, I, you know, it's such a strange time and it feels really fitting that an album has come out called Jubilee because it's been such a year of release for a lot of people. So even just going out and seeing people for the first time is already so overwhelming and exciting um, that also releasing this record and this book and, and finally having it out in the world, it just it feels like such a release on so many different levels for me. So it, it's been really surreal, but uh, very relieving and exciting. Well, congratulations. And on Jubilee and also on your amazing book, Crying in H Mart, which I'm actually in the midst of reading right now and I can't put it down. I actually, it was hard to stop reading it and come to work this morning. <laughs> it's definitely one of those kind of reads. And that came out in April. And it was just announced recently that that's going to be a feature film. So uh, more congratulations to you. It sounds like you're working with a powerhouse team. And I heard that you're going to do the music for that as well. Can is, is there anything you can tell? I mean, I imagine you're in very early stages right now and don't have yeah, a lot of details. But Very early stages. But of course, uh, it was super important for me to supervise the soundtrack as a musician uh, whose life has been deeply impacted by music. And uh, actually, one of the producers, Stacy Schur, um, is the producer behind Garden State. And for me, that was like such a seminal coming of age film for a lot of millennials. And that soundtrack in particular, I feel like was such a soundtrack for, for my teenage years that I, I really hope to, to find um, that same sort of connection with other people through that soundtrack when the time comes. Oh, I look forward to it. Um, your first two albums and your memoir, Crying in H Mart, are all about your love for your mom and the complex, very multifaceted relationship you had with her. Does your mom show up on Jubilee? She does. I mean, I think that she'll in some ways always uh, be a part of, of my work. I mean, even to write songs about joy, I think it's it's all kind of in relation to finally giving myself permission to feel that for the first time. And it was a real journey to get there. And I think my mom and, and that loss will always sort of be a major part of my, my narrative as an artist. Um, but yeah, I, there's a song called In Hell in particular that still kind of grapples with grief. And I think it was important for me to put that on there, especially where it lands on the record, because, you know, it's kind of incredible that we as human beings can be so resilient and, and go through these really dark times and still navigate um, back to joy. And that was really important for me to incorporate on the record. And I think in some ways, finally writing this book and saying everything that I needed to say about her loss um, sort of paved the way for this album. It made me feel like I had said everything that I needed to say about that. And um yeah, I was just ready to, to take on a new topic. Well, you wrote Jubilee, as you say, around this unadulterated happiness, childhood optimism, and applying it to adulthood. And I talk with so many artists about how writing songs about grief 
can be a cathartic process. And it does sound like you reached a different kind of catharsis by intentionally exploring joy. I do, yeah. I mean, it, it felt like I, I was ready to let it in. And um, it's such an important part of our lives that we have to always chase after. And it was it was such a wonderful release to finally get to that place in my life where I, I sort of gave myself permission to feel those things. Well, joy feels like an emotion that so many of us need right now, especially. So it's a wonderful time for the record to come out. And you and your band created some wonderful videos just for KEXP. So let's watch a couple of those now. It's Japanese Breakfast Live on KEXP at Home, songs from the new album, Jubilee. Enjoy. So 
That's Japanese Breakfast Live on KEXP at Home. The song's Kokomo, Indiana, and Tactics. Michelle, the album cover for Jubilee is so bright and eye-catching, and it clearly, affle- uh, it clearly reflects the emotions that you're hoping to convey on this record. And I love how it ties in food, which I think I can confidently say plays a large role in your life as an artist. What draws you to the image of persimmons? Is there a significance there? I thought a lot about the color yellow for this album. I had a pretty broad theme going in that it was going to be an album about joy and that yellow was going to play a major role in it. And I think that for me, the third record, you really start to think about your albums in context of one another. So I was thinking about how Psychopomp is this sort of light blue color and and Soft Sounds is dark red and and black and very moody. And I wanted to just have a really warm, uh, warm tone new album to represent this sort of new sonic shift. And uh, yeah, persimmons are really popular in East Asia and, and in, in Korea and in Japan. They, they'll they hang them up. Um, and so they'll, they'll be these sort of really hard, bitter fruit that allows time to mature it into something that's very sweet and palatable. And it felt like a sort of apt metaphor for someone who's written a lot about grief and loss and these sort of difficult topics and is trying to mature into something a little bit sweeter. I do love the imagery around this whole record, uh, the videos, the artwork, and you're just so creative. I know you must work with a team of people, but I get the feeling that your imprint is all over this. And I read in an interview that you admitted that you had not been very creative during the pandemic, and I know you made Jubilee before that. When did you make the record and can you describe what that experience was like and kind of paint a picture for us? Sure. I I recorded most of the album in Philadelphia in December of 2019 and I had just turned in the rough draft for Crying in H Mart in July and sort of spent these the six months away from it when my editor had it uh, working on the record. And it was really a great time for me because I was really struggling writing this book and and very much feeling around in the dark that by the time I got to writing and working on the record it was sort of like falling back into a really familiar bed I was just so excited to get to collaborate with other people again because writing a book is such an insular isolating experience and so uh, I just I, I really returned to music with a real joy because I, it was something familiar that I loved and, and could work on with other people. You kind of flip flop the release of the record and the book. I imagine you intended to release the record a lot earlier. Has that kind of worked out um, to be something that you've been happy with? Yeah, initially... I was just devastated that there was going to be this four-year gap in my discography, which is such a petty thing to be (laughs) devastated over uh, in light of the times. Um, But I think it actually worked out really well. I mean, the book coming out before the record, it was almost like showcasing that this is what I had to go through to get to this album in a way. And it felt very fitting that I had said everything I needed to say about something that I've explored for a long time with my art to get to this new place. And I think that narrative really resonated with some people and, and I'm, I'm really happy with the way that it turned out now. I love that we get to see and learn about and know all these sides of you. It's been really fun to read all these articles, and it seems like they're not all saying the same thing. Every time I read something new, I learn something new about you that's really interesting and fun. And then the record comes out, and I get to dig into that. One of the first things I noticed when listening to Jubilee are the string and horn arrangements. Can you tell me more about those? Because I I actually... Uh, also read, clearly I've been reading up a lot <laughs> Thanks, Cheryl. You. It's just, it's just been fun to watch the journey, you know, to see you have these two new babies out there in the world <laughs> and, uh, you know, just read about what you're feeling about them. But I read that you've been studying music theory. Did you help compose some of those strings and horns? I did. Um, I started working on another player in this in this whole mess of releases that I have a, a soundtrack for this video game called Sable that's coming out in September 23rd. And so I spent a lot of time like working with these various plugins and started writing um, with these string and horn plugins and also 
by nature of, of having toured for the last three years, we've, we've met some really fantastic musicians like Adam Schatz, uh, who plays in Landlady and is an exceptional saxophone player, and Molly Germer, who plays violin. And so I definitely had more confidence of trying to employ um, a larger sonic palette. And then, of course, Craig Hendricks, who's our drummer and, and a longtime co-producer and, and collaborator, helped also write a lot of the, the string and horn arrangements on songs like Tactics and Kokomo. Tell me more about Sable. I'm not a huge video game person, but it sounds super cool. I mean, is it supposed to be sort of about a girl's, young girl's rite of passage quest? It is. It's an open world game. There's no combat. Um, it is largely inspired by Breath of the Wild and, and the art of Mobius and Studio Ghibli. And I've been really lucky that they sort of folded me into the project pretty early, maybe three or four years ago. And, and I've been working on it ever since. But it's an absolutely gorgeous game. It's an open world where uh, a young girl named Sable sort of explores this um, desert planet and you get to learn about the different cultures and uh, the creative director Greg Kithriotis has an architectural back has an architecture background so all of the architecture in the game is really intricate and, and beautiful and uh, I'm really proud to be a part of it. It must have been fun to be involved in something different and creative like that. It sounds like you've been super busy. I mean, you've been working on other music videos, directing music videos for other people, and you've dabbled in television. I know that you had your food series, and you've been doing a lot. It doesn't really sound like you have been not, you know, sitting back not being very creative. You've talked about not having a great work-life balance and maybe <laughs> that work, just all work is your balance. Tell me what the first year of the pandemic was like for you. It was tough. I mean, it was it was hard for me because I feel like honestly after my mom passed away, I put so much stock in in my work ethic and ambition as a form of self-care. And so to adjust that and sort of slow down um, was pretty difficult. But one thing that was helpful for me was I, I, I did spend a lot of time um, trying to practice my craft. I spend a lot of time uh, practicing the piano and the guitar and uh, particularly with the piano, I think like when it felt like so much was sort of out of our control, there's something really comforting about returning to a piece of music every day and, and watching it slowly come together and that being something that was in your control. So I tried to to navigate the pandemic with these these types of exercises to, to make make sure I didn't lose my mind, I guess. And now you're busier than ever, and <laughs> I'm so happy that you made the time to talk with us today and create these beautiful videos. Let's listen to a couple more. We're live on KEXP at home with Japanese Breakfast, and this song's called Be Sweet.
That's Japanese Breakfast Live on KEXP at Home. You just heard Be Sweet and Savage Good Boy. Be Sweet was the first song that you released from Jubilee, and you wrote that song with Jack Tatum of Wild Nothing. And I heard that initially you thought you were collaborating on a song that was going to be pitched to a pop artist. What made you want to keep it? Oh, you know, our labels actually lied to us and, and told us that the other person wanted help with their record. And we got into the studio and we were like, I'm not working on a record. What are you talking about? And so we decided it would be better use of our time to maybe just write a really catchy pop song and try to pitch it to someone. Um, but I just ended up really loving what we made. Um, I think I showed Jack this uh, this like 80s funk band, this 80s Korean funk band called the Bunny Girls that had this really in-your-face bass line. And then I had this... Um, you know, very simple keyboard line. And then watching Jack come up with the bass line and the percussion for that song, it just came together so quickly and it was just so effortlessly catchy and fell into place so quickly. And um, I just felt like I had to keep it. It was such a back pocket single to sort of base the next record on. And and I had a feeling that that was going to be um, the ticket. <laughs> It is super catchy, the song of the summer for sure. And the video for that one is so <laughs> fun, a little sort of Mulder and Scully vibe going with the extraterrestrial theme there. I have to say the videos for this record are insane for Savage Good Boy and Posing in Bondage, which ever since I saw that video, that's my current favorite song. I just can't listen to it enough. But I mean... Number one, Michael Imperioli. <laughs> Number two, the outfits and hats and hair and makeup <laughs> and jewelry and the nails. I mean, love, love, love. Who came up with the concept for these videos and where did all that beautiful um, styling come from? Uh, thank you. Um, Cece Liu is, is the stylist that I worked with and she just went so hard on it. It was really fun. The, you know, theme was this sort of like industrial post-apocalyptic bunker meets this kind of Rococo extravagance. And yeah, when I told her, uh, about the concept, she just, she just came back with the most incredible clothing and, um, yeah, you know, Posing in Bondage and, and Savage Good Boy were concepts that I had for a while. Um, Be Sweet was really tough because, you know, we the pandemic hit like right before we were about to shoot that music video. And then I had to completely reconceptualize uh, and, and really scale it down. And I was with Adam Kolodny, who is my cinematographer. We've done all of the videos together. And we were watching this Spike Jones DVD and uh, the sabotage, the BZ Boys video for Sabotage uh, really struck us because we were just like really stumped on what to do. And it kind of like hit a nerve where we we're just like, oh, it's just have fun, like have fun with the music video. And that's what makes a really good music video is almost like we had forgotten for a moment. And so we kind of decided to, to combine um, the sort of goofy theatrics of the Beastie Boys Savage, uh, sabotage video with um, X-Files, uh, Aliens and, and Mulder and Scully dynamics. So that was where that concept came from. We kind of came up with it together. It totally has the sabotage vibe now that you mention it. I love that video. Well, Adam has said that you've always had a clear vision of what you want and that you would eventually direct a feature film. And I know you have a degree in film studies as well as in creative writing. Is film something that interests you? I mean, obviously your book is being made into a film. I don't know what kind of a role you'll have in that. But is directing something you want to do on that scale? Yeah, I mean, I think that that is the sort of largest mountain in the arts to climb. And there is, of course, something that's really enticing about that. But I don't feel quite ready to take it on. I think maybe if I am able to uh, be a part of, of Crying in H Mart, the film, and see something made on a larger scale, then I'll, I'll, I'll have a better idea of how to wrap my head around a feature. Maybe, but someday, I, I think that I think I might have it in me. I love how food also makes its way into almost everything, and you're eating noodles in a couple of those videos. I think it's both Be Sweet and Posing in Bondage, and makes me want to ask, what did you eat for breakfast this morning? 
Oh, I ate something. I, to be completely honest, I was a little bit hungover this morning and I ate um, white rice with a poached egg, a pad of butter and sesame oil. It was really simple, but it was, it was very tasty and kimchi. I have very often eaten breakfast very similar to that. <laughs> I have a wicked sweet tooth, but I never like sweet in my whole life, even from a kid, have never liked sweet things in the morning, oddly enough. And so many breakfast foods here in the West are, you know, centered around sweet things, oatmeal or cereals or pastries. And I've always loved savory foods. So I love following your Instagram <laughs> and hearing about all the foods because my perfect morning would be, you know, some sort of rice, miso soup, uh, some sort of a grilled fish or protein. So kimchi would be great. So <laughs> I wish that it were easier for me to grab something like that and I didn't have to cook it every day because it's time consuming to make something like that. And traditionally, you're not supposed to, to have it um, already made, right? It's something you're supposed to make fresh every day. Yeah, I guess I, I like to, Yeah. <laughs> I like, as I mentioned, I love watching your little Instagram stories and you have such a variety of things on there. I, I was particularly enchanted. You had a little, let's make kimchi for stir fried rice <laughs> over a campfire and you were in yeah. front of a tent in what looked like the room that you're sitting in right now. I, you yeah, you were not yeah. out in the forest, but it just really looks like you're having fun with all of this. And <laughs> I yeah, really I tried to like be creative with every little thing. That was like a funny prompt that the publisher was like, can you make a little cooking video? And I was like, I guess I'll just order a tent for some reason. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm really lucky that this is my job because I, I feel like I have so much to express all the time. And it's it's fun getting to just basically play little games uh, in your adult life. <laughs> Well, in addition to writing music and a memoir, you've also directed a handful of music videos, um, both for yourself and bands such as Charlie Bliss and I'm thinking j -Som, I think. How do you find inspiration for the visual aesthetics of music like that? Are you constantly aware of them when you're writing and then putting them, you know, into some of these other projects that you work on for other people? I think it sort of comes with the song, you know. I just try to understand for other people just who, how I see them as uh, in 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 the music world, and what sort of idea comes from from the lyrics and and the sonic qualities of the song. Uh, but it's different every time. I feel like for Jay Som, you know, I just so at the time just so associated her with the Bay Area and and wanted to just make this really colorful. Um, honestly jubilant video that that was set in the bay area and for capacity i uh for charlie bliss i i think i was like just watching a lot of heist movies at the time and was inspired by like ocean's 11 or something and thought like how do i they're all just set, they're all like kind of from these like theatrical backgrounds and i kind of wanted to utilize each one of them as a different type of character and and thought like the heist plot would work really well for for creating characters for each one of them. I love that. It reminds me of when, as a DJ, people are asking me, how do you get, know what you're going to play on the air? Are you just listening to music all the time? And in a way, the answer is yes. I mean, I'm always taking it in no matter what I'm doing. I might be in a store and a song is playing and I write it down on my phone or you're watching <laughs> a TV series or a movie. It's just you're you're always taking taking it in wherever you are and you never know how you're going to use it, it sounds like. Completely. We also saw that you have a massive tour coming up, uh, several nights here in Seattle. I'm excited to see. <laughs> and um, it must have been wonderful to get together with your band to create some of these videos during the pandemic and do some of these performances. But I mean... I, I know this sort of rhetorical question, but you must just be overjoyed about getting out on the road and sharing this music with a live audience and playing live with these people that you love. I'm so excited, and I'm I, in in some senses like it's better that we've had so much time to plan them because they're you know larger arrangements and and bigger songs, and so we're bringing out a six piece band for the first time. We'll have Adam Schatz on saxophone and. Um, uh, Macy Stewart from Ohm is going to be playing uh, violin with us on, on this next tour. And yeah, I feel like we we got to take our time bringing the, the tracks to life and I, I can't wait to play 
live music again, and I can't wait to Seattle. We've we've gotten this um, great tradition going where people have started bringing fruit for one reason or another um, to our shows, and so I'm curious how many how many persimmons might show up <laughs> at these upcoming shows. <laughs> I'm sure a ton. <laughs> You're going to have a basket full of fruit from Seattle. <laughs> Well, I have such fond memories of all the times that we've spoken, and I'm so happy to chat with you today. I look forward to seeing the band perform live, and I thank you so much for taking the time today. Oh, thank you so much, Cheryl. It's so great to to chat again. Thanks to all of our wonderful listeners for supporting these great sessions, and it's such a pleasure to have Japanese Breakfast live on KEXP at home. Discover new music at listenerpoweredkexp.org.